So, our journey through Mark continues. And we arrive at these, some notoriously scathing and pretty scary verses for us. Maybe even verses we tend to gloss over to avoid the difficult challenge of Jesus is talking about money. Jesus talks about money more than anything else other than the kingdom of God. We cannot avoid this difficult truth. Jesus drew no boundaries on the spiritual aspects of life. For Jesus, following God required allegiance in every aspect of one's life. And as we said up last week, Jesus points us here to the personal nature of faith. The man comes to Jesus inquiring about eternal life. Jesus' first answer is, look to God and follow the commandments. The man quickly comes back at Jesus, I have followed the rules. He comes back with that quick anxiousness we all know too well. I do play by the rules. There is still something missing. Jesus does not become frustrated with the man. Jesus does not become impatient at his short-sightedness. Rather, the man's continued hope, anxious and unresolved, causes Jesus to look at the man. Jesus really looks at the man and really sees him and has love for him. Jesus can easily see what continues to enslave the questing man. And Jesus' heart is filled with compassion. It is what the man has a great deal of, which continues to enslave him. Continues to keep him from being free, from being timeless. It is exactly what the man has spent his time, energy, and sweat, care, days of journeys, months of planning, years of dreaming and scheming to acquire, to build up, to stack high, to line up around him, to make him feel accomplished. And that is what God requires him. I knew I was getting a treat, at least one treat. 
cup of ice cream from the freezer, a piece of candy from her pocket, a nickel shot in my hand walking out the door. I wasn't allowed to leave without taking it. Going to Grammy crisis as a little girl was the best. I knew I with the world comes from what I do with my life. 
for me to share with the world out of my abundance. Many of my books were so specialized and so precious to me. I couldn't bear the thought of just bringing them into the rubbish sale. My books, my precious books, they had to go to someone who really needed them, who would really appreciate them. So I thought of the best way I knew to make that connection, to sell them super cheap on Amazon. If someone needs a book, they're going to be looking for it. And what a blessing if they can find a well cared for copy super, super cheap. Now, this sounded like a great plan to me, rationally. But one of the things I have not yet shared with you is that I do have a few irrational fears. They are silly. But just like any human, I'm a bit silly and not always rational. Just a few very silly, very irrational fears. And one of them happens to be the post office. <laughs> For some very odd reason, maybe it's because I grew up going to that scary one on my street in Pottstown, I don't know. For whatever reason, all throughout my childhood, my teenage years, my 20s, even into my 30s, I have had this fear of the post office. They make me Quilting was a great way to 
and made one for each of the little ones in my family. And then I was brave enough to try a full-size quilt for myself. I loved quilting. And very quickly, I was working on three different full-size quilts for myself. And after a while, a few years pass, and you actually start finishing those big quilts. And a quilter starts to realize at about that time in her quilting life, wow, I Not the pulpit. I knew myself. I do not. 
So careful. 